Let's pray. God, we look forward to that day when with all the redeemed from all time, we will sing. We will never grow weary of singing and reflecting on your great love, your great love which has qualified us to share in your glory. What a remarkable thing will it be for us to be amazed that we could be inheritors of such infinite treasures and that that was purchased for us at such infinite cost. It's a joy for us to sing of these things now, a joy for us to reflect on them, a joy for us to anticipate all that you have in store for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, we are making our way on Sunday mornings through the book of Romans. I would invite you to turn to the next verse, Romans chapter 9. And this morning we're going to start something of a new section, and we'll look together at Romans 9, 1 through 5. A number of years ago, I got to climb Camelback Mountain. We've done that several times as a family. Many of you have done that. Uh, it's an exciting adventure. Uh, the top of Camelback Mountain gives you a nice panoramic view of this valley. There are a couple of routes up. One of them is a longer meandering uh, hike uphill the whole way. Uh, the shorter route is sometimes more like climbing than hiking and is challenging. One of the times that we went up Camelback Mountain, we had some people with us that planned not to go to the top. And so we left them somewhere on the trail behind us. And, and as great as it was to climb the last rock and wash, walk up the last few steps and get to the peak of Camelback Mountain and catch a breath, drink some water, and look around, there's a bit of sadness that those who were with us couldn't see what we were seeing couldn't experience what we were experiencing. We had left them behind. There was simultaneous elation and relief. Oh, this climb is over. But also disappointment. Man, they were so close. I, I wish they were here. And you and I have been climbing the mountain of God's glorious plan of salvation through the book of Romans. And we've gotten to, in a very real sense, the summit, the apex of this plan of salvation, the culmination of the joy of salvation in Romans chapter 8. We've been soaring the heights of Romans 8 with its stunning vistas of God's grace, our glorious standing in Christ, the indwelling power and work of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the security of the believer. And we've been rejoicing together as we've seen from this vantage point all that it means to belong to Christ. And when we get to Romans 9, we might expect a doxology followed by a therefore. You know, the end of Romans 8 should be this, and glory to God forever and ever, amen. Now, therefore, go live in light of these truths. But we don't get a doxology and a therefore for another three chapters. There's intervening material between here and the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12, where the therefore, the pivot in the book of Romans happens, where Paul unfolds for us, how should we live in light of this salvation we're rejoicing in? What is this intervening material? We have three whole chapters devoted to a serious problem. Romans 9 through 11 are the problem of Israel. These three chapters have produced or, re or reflect in the Apostle Paul such remarkable grief that the Apostle has a hard time even describing it. And so we've been climbing this mountain of God's salvation and just rejoicing in all that he's done at the end of chapter 8, and then it's a bummer in chapter 9. And we should feel the sorrow that Paul feels. And we're going to spend a little more time in terms of an introduction this morning than is usual, because we're introdu introducing an entire section of God's Word. 
And this section has to do with the spiritual state of the nation of Israel in Paul's day. If you and I were reading this letter to the Romans for the very first time, if we were believers in a church in the city of Rome, that we would be in a church with a mixed population, with mixed ethnicities, mixed backgrounds. There would be some Jews in our midst, and there would be a predominant number of non-Jews, Gentiles. You know that God's dealings with people centered in Israel and centered with the Jewish people for millennia, and some had embraced Messiah Jesus, and most had not. And so while the early church in its very first days was almost universally Jewish, as time went on in the first century, it became predominantly Gentile. And even more so as the gospel went out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And as the church found itself at Rome, it found itself a population of probably more Gentile than Jew. And the Jews who were there were those who were pretty far removed from Jerusalem and its culture and its experiences. And if we were reading Romans for the first time, I think we would feel things that are very foreign to us here. When Paul says, for instance, in the first chapter that he is the apostle to the Gentiles and he's eager to preach the gospel not only to the Jew but to the Greek... When he says things like the gospel is the power of God for salvation for the Jew first and then for the Greek. If we were reading that for the first time, we would feel ethnic tension. And perhaps we would feel, if we had known our Old Testaments, we might feel a taste of Paul's sorrow in that. Paul, of course, as a Jew, set apart by God to take the message of the Jewish Messiah to the Gentile world. And what did Paul do everywhere he went? Where's the synagogue? I'm going to preach the gospel in the synagogue until they kick me out. And listen, the, the Jews that heard Paul's message in large part were offended at the idea that a Nazarene and a criminal crucified by the Romans could be anything special, special, much less the Messiah. They're offended by that. They're, of course, offended by the notion that this Messiah was, in fact, God in the flesh. And they were offended at his resurrection from the dead. And there were times where people would listen to Paul up to the point of his saying these very offensive things, these stumbling block issues. But one of the most offensive things Paul said throughout his ministry was, okay, if you're rejecting Christ Messiah and his resurrection, then I will go proclaim these same things to the Gentiles. That caused no small stir. And it makes you think, well, what is it, Israel? Do you want Jesus as your Messiah? No, you don't want him. Okay, well, then we'll go tell that to the Gentiles. No, you definitely don't want that. And this is the tension, this is the, the, the world, the tangled world that Paul, the Jew, apostle of the Gentiles, lived in his whole life. And so to write this letter to the Roman believers, he has a pastoral concern here. He wants peace amongst Jew and Gentile in the church. He has a pastoral concern here for humans followers of Jesus Christ who are prone to pride. He will crush Jewish pride. He will crush Gentile pride in this letter. And Paul has a concern that these Jew and Gentile believers together in Rome would further his gospel efforts farther and farther away. Right? This is a missionary support letter to get Paul past Rome into Spain and beyond with this gospel. And so in explaining the gospel to them, 
Paul can't simply move from the end of chapter 8, no separation from Christ, into the therefore of Romans chapter 12, 1. Because if you were reading this letter for the first time and you had gotten to Romans chapter 8 and you hear these magnificent promises for us in the gospel, that there is forgiveness of sin, there is adoption unto sonship by grace, there is love, there is inseparable commitment from God to us through Him. We will never be cut off, never separated. If you're reading this letter for the first time, you should stop at Romans chapter 8 and ask the question, God, why should I believe you? It appears that People to whom you made promises are cut off, separated. They've rejected Messiah and they're cut off from all the blessings of Messiah. There's a problem with Romans. If we were to go from Romans 8 to Romans 12 and not solve this problem, God's integrity would be at stake. The validity of God's promises would be at stake. And because such magnificent promises are made for us who believe in Christ in chapter 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, these very promises are at stake in what God does with his own word in relationship to the people of Israel. These three chapters set forth to answer the question that's posed for us in Romans 9 chapter 6, or 9 verse 6. We'll deal with this in detail next time we're together. Has the word of God failed? And these three chapters set out to answer that question. The answer is no. (laughs) But what we get to discover is, okay, how has the word of God not failed? If God made promises to Israel and they are cut off. That is what Paul seeks to deal with. The main idea here in this passage is that Israel's rejection of Messiah poses a problem. Israel's rejection of Messiah poses a problem, and it poses a problem for the nation of Israel, for the integrity of God, and for the believers of God's promises. That is the problem Paul seeks to address in these three chapters. And the problem for Israel is this. Despite all of her privileges, she in large part is cut off from God because of unbelief. Now, the problem for God's integrity is this, if God made promises to Israel that do not come to fruition, then what good are his promises? And that leads to the, pro- the problem for us, believers of God's promises. If God made promises to Israel that do not come to pass, then where is my security? Can I believe Romans 8? I mean, there's some staggering promises were made to us in Romans 8. What, what if I sin? What, what if I wobble? Will those promises be negated? Will will I be cut off? How do I know that I will finally escape judgment? How do I know that I will not lose my status as justified or my place as adopted or my home as heaven? This is how Romans 8 and Romans 9 are connected. We can't separate them. Some have suggested that Romans 9 to 11 is unrelated to Romans 1 to 8. That, that really the book of Romans is 1 to 8 and then 12 and following. And, and, and Paul needed somewhere to insert this treatise on election. So he plopped it right in here. Uh, that is a prevailing historical view of this section of Scripture. Some have gone so far to say that Romans 9 to 11 was a separate sermon that Paul wrote. And he simply copy-pasted it into Romans. And at the end of Romans 8 was as good a place as any. But Romans 9 to 11 is actually critical to Paul's explanation of the gospel, especially in the first century, especially to a group of believers like those gathered in the city of Rome, a mixed audience, some Jews and many Gentiles. Paul writes in 11.13, I'm writing to you who are Gentiles, right? And, and, and back in the introduction in Romans 1, 5 to 7, Paul says this, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you. Paul is writing to a predominantly Gentile audience at Rome. 
Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He regularly preached to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And you and I, by the time we get to the end of Romans 8, ought to be troubled by something. And, and, and if we know our Old Testaments, if we've been reading our Old Testaments, there are things we should be troubled by. We should feel this tension, this problem of the word of God seeming not to come to fruition on behalf of Israel to whom he made promises. The solution is unfolded for us in chapters 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 9, we, we learn that salvation is by grace. In chapter 10, we learn that salvation comes through faith in the gospel. And in chapter 11, we learn that the gospel will come to Israel, both Israel in remnant form and Israel in restoration form. I'll walk through those again. The, the solution in 9, 10, and 11 in chapter 9, that salvation is by grace. And here, Paul will unfold for us the doctrine of election. By the way, election is something like the opposite of obligation. And so, grace and election are, are really synonymous ideas. Think about this. If God saved you because of something in you or because of something from you, then it's not grace. It's obligation. For God to choose you despite you is love and grace. If God is obligated to return the favor because I was beautiful enough to be saved or meritorious enough to earn it, then it's not grace. And the solution to the problem, in part, in chapter 9, is the doctrine of election. Listen, nobody gets into God's salvation merely by being somebody. You don't get into God's salvation by your heredity, riding the genetic coattails of your parents. We're going to learn that about Abraham and his children. Some were saved and some were not. And what's the difference? The difference is grace. The difference is God's initiating love that is the salvation of those who believe from beginning to end. God does the work. So part of the solution to the problem is simply the doctrine of election. That God is kind in choosing people to set his affections on. And if he didn't choose anybody, nobody would be saved. In chapter 10, the second part of the solution is that that salvation comes through faith in the gospel. That is, you have to believe. Again, you, you don't get in just because your parents are in. You don't get in because you're a Jew. You, you have to believe. Any view of apostate Israel today that assumes that they're in simply because they're Jews is erroneous. Any Jew who gets to heaven has to do so by faith. And so Romans 10, and this access to God by grace through faith is available to anyone who believes. That's the second part of the solution. Third part of the solution is chapter 11, that God doesn't renege on his promises and the gospel will come to Israel. It will be by grace, it will be through faith, and it will come to Israel. And, and there's two sides to the gospel coming to Israel. One is the remnant side, the other is restoration. Remnant means that God always keeps a remnant. There's always a, a, a trickle of Jewish people in the church. Just like there was a trickle of faithful Israel in the Old Testament amidst the mass of Israel, there are a few Jews in the church. Can you think of some? Like Every writer of the New Testament, <laughs> Luke might be an exception, maybe. And all throughout history, there have been people who believed, right? Um, God has been very kind. But, but there's another restoration, or there's another part of the gospel coming to Israel that is, we find at the end of Romans 11, and that is the restoration of Israel, that is the fulfillment of God's promises to actually restore them, not apart from belief, but right through the doorway of believing the gospel, that the nation en masse will believe the truth of the gospel. That's coming. So that's how Paul lays out the solution to the problem of Israel. 
And, and we'll walk through these as we go through these three chapters. You need to know something as we march into Romans 9, that Romans 9 to 11 will step on some toes. It's going to step on some toes. It, it sets out to crush human pride. And I'll give you several categories of toes to get stepped on. Number one is people who believe they're good with God by right. By heredity, by merit, that, that somehow God is obligated to them because of who they are and what they've done. This would be Jewish pride or religious pride or the pride of those who believe that God is on their side simply because of where they live, to whom they were born, or because of what they've accomplished. There's a second set of toes that this set of scriptures will step on, and that is people who believe that God is done with Israel. It's going to step on those toes. And and this is a very common view amongst evangelicals throughout church history that God is finished with Israel. One of my heroes is John Owen, and he's written a monumental commentary set on the book of Hebrews. Volume after volume after volume after volume of commentary on Hebrews. His first two volumes are introductory material. And 150 pages are devoted to this question. If 1,600 years are not enough to prove to you that God is done with Israel, I don't know what more proof you could use. That was John Owen's argument when he wrote in the 1600s. Israel didn't exist as, as a nation. This was pre-Zionist movement. This was pre-Balfour Declaration. This was uh, the pre-regathering of Jews into the land of Palestine. And John Owen said, you don't need any more proof that God is done with Israel. I love John Owen. But I disagree. I think Paul disagrees. Interestingly enough, 150 years after Owen, you have a, uh, another man in, in the same sort of theological stream named J.C. Ryle, who still prior to Balfour Declaration, Zionist movement, and uh, the population of Palestine by ethnic Israel, who wrote that God will keep his promises to Israel. And people said, you're crazy. He said, well, I, I can't get away from my Bible. Yeah, but there is no Israel. Yeah, but my Bible says. No, but they don't even have a land. Yeah, but my Bible says. <laughs> They're scattered all over the earth. They live in every country and they speak all the other languages. Yes, but my Bible says. And so I, I would not be surprised to, to, to find, um, even here this morning, uh, those who wrestle with this question. And listen, this is a good question to wrestle with. What is God doing with Israel? Has the church replaced Israel? Is the church the new Israel? Does the church supersede Israel? Uh, there are a lot of different ways that people have sought out to try to reconcile this problem. I think what we're going to find in Romans 9 to 11 is that the church and Israel are not the same. They're not the same entity. And the church neither replaces nor supersedes Israel, but these distinct Sets of people with whom God is dealing in his redemptive plan of salvation history. He is doing different things with them for a purpose. And that anyone who gets to heaven gets to heaven the same one way. But God is doing something with these peoples to magnify his own glory. And we get to see how he does that. I remember sitting with a, a theologian, a, a writer... Uh, who's kind of one of the prominent writers in, in his theological perspective. And he said, listen, Israel had their chance. They blew it. It's our turn. And that may have been a, a very short and uncouth way to describe his way of thinking about Israel. Um, but it's not uncommon. By the way, ethnic Israel is referred to by my count in Romans 9 to 11 some 93 times. And, and it means Israel every time. And, and we get to walk through that together. Nowhere in your Bible, by the way, is the term Israel used to describe the church. Not one place. There are distinct entities in, in all of your Bible. What we get to see is the past history, the present condition, and the future restoration of ethnic Israel, all detailed in this section. There's a third set of toes that, that this... <laughs> 
set of chapters is likely to step on. And it is people who esteem human freedom. Maybe a, a, a false notion of fairness or have wrongly esteemed human ability. They are offended at the sovereignty of God in salvation. The doctrines of election and predestination are detailed in these chapters uh, very clearly to, again, to answer the questions related to the problem of Israel. But the answer to those things is all God's grace. That Jewish pride would be crushed, that Gentile pride would be, would be crushed, human pride will be crushed. A new word emerges from Romans 9 to the end of the book that we haven't seen yet in Romans. It's the word mercy. Mercy shows up here nine times in chapters 9 to 11, three more times before the letter to the Romans is done. And it simply means pity on suffering people who are in dire straits, people who can't help themselves, people who can't get out of a jam, and God is merciful. And what Romans 9 to 11 does is crush human pride in order to exalt God's glory by His giving mercy to undeserving sinners of every stripe. Think about the way that God has orchestrated salvation. Israel, with all of her privileges, did not recognize Messiah when He came. They crucified Him, rejected Him and were rejected for their unbelief. God, and this we'll use the illustration Paul is going to use with us in a few chapters, God grafts in wild, uncultivated olive branches for everybody but Dan, I think, and maybe a few others. Um, Us Gentiles, outsiders, grafted into the rich root of the olive tree. We, we ought to be saying as Gentiles, and we would be saying this if we lived in the first century and were reading the book of Romans for the first time, how did I get here? Why do I get to have the, the sap from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises? I'm not from around here. And God, by His grace, cut me off, plucked me, and put me into the rich root of this olive tree. What? Oh, mercy. Meanwhile, Israel cut off for unbelief like dead branches on the ground. And we get to find out that God, just as easy it was for him to take wild, uncultivated olive branches and and graft them into the rich root of the olive tree, it's actually easier for him to take those natural branches and regraft them in, and he will. And so don't despise the natural branches, Gentiles, (laughs) to us, don't despise the natural branches. And to Jews, believe, believe. And a Jew that was enriched with all the privileges and then cut off for unbelief and then grafted back in will say for the first time, I don't belong here. What mercy. This is exactly where Romans 11 ends, culminates, 33 to 36. The unbelievable wisdom of God is mercy. Nobody saw this coming. Nobody could have planned this. Nobody could have been God's counselor. He came up with this plan all his own so that everybody who gets to heaven looks around and says, what am I doing here? I don't belong. And do you remember what the Jews were accustomed to saying in the first century? Oh, we have Abraham as our father. We're in. God says, "I I can raise up stones to be children of Abraham. And God is decimating that pride. And and I think Romans 9 to 11 is is written in large part to Gentiles to crush our pride and to long for the salvation of Israel. All right, that's the introduction. Here's the the point. Israel's rejection of Messiah poses a problem for the nation of Israel, for the integrity of God, and for the believers of God's promises. Paul introduces us to this problem in the first five verses of Romans 9, revealing three realities. Three realities. Number one, Paul's sorrow. Do you feel this? We haven't even read the passage yet. I'm so sorry. Let's read the whole passage. We'll come back and look at these three points. I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. 
My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. And we see first Paul's sorrow, his sorrow in verse 1 and 2. And he starts with three ways to say, I'm serious. <laughs> I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. He's really trying to get a point across. <laughs> this isn't showmanship. This isn't drama. Paul's not making something up. He's not being theatrical here. This is real. He says first, I'm telling the truth in Christ. Paul's union with Christ is invoked. The sorrow he describes here is not merely peripheral to his being. It's at the core of who he is. Then he says, I'm not lying. And then he concludes that with, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. This is, this is beyond the normal expression of the human conscience. You, you know that you can misinform your conscience. You can bind your conscience to things that aren't true. Your conscience needs to be brought in line with the Word of God. But here, we have an expression of something like a Holy Spirit-informed apostolic conscience. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit, says the Apostle Paul. And what is he feeling? Why does he go to such lengths to convince us of the truth of what he's about to say? Well, because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And, and Paul has not been living under Mosaic law. I grant that he had Timothy circumcised, but he chose not to have Titus circumcised. Do you understand? He, he's something of a renegade. If, if you thought that Mosaic law was forever and we have to live under it, Paul's not doing that. And yet he preached Jesus from Mosaic law as the Messiah, as resurrected from the dead, and he preached the need of regeneration, new birth producing repentance and faith. And he preached the need for repentance in synagogues, just like John the Baptist before him, to the Jews, repent, you need to turn, you're, you're not good enough as you are, you need something else. And he preached this everywhere he went. Now, what was the response to the Apostle Paul as a Jew, as an apostle to the Gentiles? Rocks, beatings, violent flash mobs, assassination attempts, legal battles, imprisonments. So one could suspect that any other man would wash his hands and be done with the Jewish people. Forget it. Not Paul. His heart broke. As he stands on the summit of the saving work of God and the dizzying heights of God's mercy and grace, he sees that his countrymen are not with him, and he grieves. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief. You, your par you parents, you know this with your kids. You, you would cut off your right arm. You would sell everything that you have if your kids could know Christ. You would do whatever it takes at whatever it would take to, to just give them salvation. Paul feels that. He is lamenting here. This is like the, the laments of the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 14. Uh, lamentations, the entire book is Jeremiah the weeping prophet, agonizing over the spiritual condition of his people and the consequences of their sin. Here's Jeremiah 4.19, my soul, my soul, Jeremiah writes, I am in anguish, oh my heart, my heart is pounding in me, I cannot be silent, because you have heard, oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. He's grieved over the spiritual status of his own people and the judgment God is bringing for it. There's a lesson for us, I think, here in, in Paul's sorrow for his countrymen. Do, do we grieve for the lost? Those close to us, those we have relationships with, those we have some kinship and affection for? Do we have unceasing anguish in our hearts? The second thing we see here, verse 3, is Paul's desire. Paul's desire. Look at verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. This word for separated is the word anathema. 
to be separated from Christ, delivered over to eternal destruction. And this word corresponds to an Old Testament word that was used for items under the ban. You remember those things? You're not allowed to have those. Those are to be delivered over to destruction. They're devoted to Yahweh for destruction. That is things that were accursed, set apart for God to destroy. Paul uses this word anathema to describe if anyone comes to you preaching another gospel, even if he's an angel from above, let him be what? Anathema. Delivered over to God for eternal destruction. This is a serious word, and Paul is calling down anathema on himself. What what, what is going on here? Paul's statement in verse 3, it it gets right up to the edge of what's totally inappropriate. Paul here is not saying, Oh Lord, please curse me in order to bring Jews to yourself. He's not saying that. The the form of the word here, uh, there's a technical category for this word, uh, but the idea here is Paul is contemplating the desire but failing to bring himself actually to the point of wishing, kind of wishing. This is why our English translations say, I could wish, I could almost wish something, Now, to to actually desire this, to to actually pray this would be wrong. It would be wrong on three counts. It would be impossible, it would be ineffective, and it would be inappropriate. Number one, it would be impossible in that no one who is in Christ can be separated from Christ, right? We just learned that in Romans chapter 8. That would be an impossible desire. But it would be ineffective in the sense that no man's suffering, no mere human's suffering could atone for others' sin. Right? Paul could not somehow go to hell and win the salvation of someone else. Right? A sinner only goes to hell for his own sins, which is exactly why Jesus the Messiah, if he pays for sins, has to be God in the flesh, has to be infinite in his nature so that he can pay for infinite crimes before the infinite holiness of his infinite father. A mere man can't do that. It would be impossible, it would be ineffective, and it would be inappropriate. It would be inappropriate for Paul to love the creature more than God. Right? We know this from Jesus. You, you can't love Jesus and love your parents more. And so Paul says, I, I could almost wish. What does, that, what does that mean? Do you remember Moses in Exodus 32? Exodus 32 is a tragic scene where the people of Israel have been rescued from Egyptian slavery, where they'd been in bondage for 400 years, and they'd been rescued by miraculous intervention of God. He splits the sea, defeats Pharaoh's army, and by miracle after miracle, sustains them, keeps them alive, protects them. And when Moses is gone for a couple of weeks, they make a golden calf and start worshiping it. Tragic scene. Moses loved his people. Moses makes entreaty before the Lord. He says, God, don't don't destroy them. God said, listen, I I can go down and destroy those people, and I can make a new nation out of you. Now, we know that wasn't God's actual plan because the promise of Messiah has to come through the line of Judah, and if God wipes out the line of Judah and makes it through Moses, God's promises fail. We know God's promises don't fail. So he's orchestrating something here. And in the orchestrating of God keeping his promises, which he made, he invites Moses in to pray. What a great incentive for us to pray in light of the sovereignty of God, not in spite of it, that God uses prayer. Prayer changes things. But notice what Moses prays in verse 32 of Exodus 32. But now, if you will, forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. He doesn't quite go so far as the Apostle Paul. I wish I could be accursed so they could be saved. But he says, listen, if they can't be saved... Curse me with them. A, I don't understand Moses. I don't understand Paul. You can feel the evocative love that they had for their people. God, you've charged me to lead these people, care of these people. Uh, God's given Paul the, the, the charge to preach the gospel. And in preaching the gospel to his countrymen, they want to beat him up and kill him. And very few turn I could wish that I were accursed on behalf of my countrymen. 
It's remarkable love. It's remarkable love. It's love like Jesus. And, and the way Paul lived his life bears out this love, does it not? You know, beaten, uh, they threw rocks at him and left him for dead. What does he do? He gets back up and walks back into the city and then goes to the next town and does the same, preaches the gospel again in the synagogues, then to the Gentiles. Paul lived this way. His own people are under condemnation when salvation is so close at hand. Propitiation is right there. Justification is right there. Adoption is right there. And they won't have it for unbelief. And Paul makes it clear who he's talking about here at the end of verse 3. These are my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now that's interesting. The, the brethren, so much in the New Testament has to do with people we're not related to, but we're related to in Christ, our brothers and sisters. And so Paul has to clarify, okay, these are my brothers, not like you and me, Jew, Gentile, together in the body of Christ, but according to the flesh, they're my brothers. That's an interesting distinction. And he feels the kinsman relationship, affection for them. And he goes on and describes them in verse 4, who are Israelites. No doubt here now who he's talking about. And in verses 4 and 5, we get the third part of Paul introducing this problem, and it is Israel's privileges. Israel's privileges. And a list of privileges here, beginning with sonship. Sonship. Who are Israelites? To whom belongs the adoption as sons? Now, we've learned in Romans chapter 8 that adoption is a precious New Testament doctrine for those who believe in Jesus Christ. And yet it was a reality that in the Old Testament, God adopted a nation. That's different in his, than his salvific adoption unto salvation. But he adopted a nation. He called Israel his son. Exodus 4.22 is one example. You will say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Hosea 11.1 1 picks up on this, out of Egypt I called my son. Talking about Israel. This term of, a, of affectionate care, of paternal privilege, belonged to Israel. The next privilege on the list is the glory. I think Paul has in mind here both the kavod and the shekinah. The, the, the weighty heaviness of the glory of God in their midst, and then the brilliant, shining Shekinah glory that showed up in the tabernacle and the temple when God dwelt among His people. Exodus 24, 16, the glory of Yahweh rested on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, He called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. And the glory of God went with the people, and it, it showed up in remarkable times, the dedication to the temple. The glory belonged to them. What a remarkable privilege that of all the nations on the earth, the God of heaven dwelt among this people, Israel. They got a front row seat to his glory. The third privilege is the covenants. Notice this is plural. This is not a contrast between the old covenant, the Old Testament, and the new covenant, the New Testament. Here, the, the covenants are described. And, and the covenants were Israel's great privilege. I think Paul has in mind here the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic covenant, Sinai covenant, Davidic covenant, and new covenant. These were the covenants given to Israel. The Noahic covenant wasn't given to Israel. Why? Israel didn't exist yet, right? If there was a covenant with Adam, it wasn't given to Israel for the same reason. But the others, the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 15, uh, confirmed to Isaac in Genesis 17, confirmed with Jacob, whose name becomes Israel in Genesis 28. And then the Mosaic covenant, the covenant given at Sinai, uh, the one that was a, more of a conditional covenant. Do these things and live. If you don't do these things, you'll be cursed. Uh, you're going to be uh, taken away uh, into captivity when you disobey, and I will bring you back and restore you to the land. There are conditional and unconditional elements in the Mosaic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, by the way, the, the promise that God made to Abraham, the idolater, that you will be my people and your descendants will be my people. That was an unconditional covenant where God promised a people, a land, a blessing, and a universal blessing. Through your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
We're reaping the fruits of that covenant even here today. This is a covenant God made with his people Israel. And then the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, God promised that through the line of Judah comes the one David and through his line will come the Messiah and David's descendant will sit on the throne of his father David and rule from Jerusalem in Israel over the nations of the earth. That was a promise made to Israel. And then the covenant made to Israel in Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, the new covenant. By the way, when the new covenant gets quoted in the New Testament, it still gets quoted as being to Israel. And we'll talk more about that as we go through Romans 9 to 11. But what remarkable privileges that God gave conditional covenants, do these things and life goes this way, do these things and life goes that way, and unconditional covenants. I'm choosing you because I love you, not because you're great, but because I want to showcase my love and mercy and grace to people who don't deserve it. Here you go. And no one can take these away. And then the next privilege they had was the law giving. At Mount Sinai, through Moses, the Ten Commandments, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, all these given by God as he revealed himself and regulated his people. Deuteronomy 4 says, What great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I'm setting before you today? You know that in the United States of America in the 21st century, we still exercise jurisprudence based on some of the features in Mosaic law given at Sinai. It really is a remarkable set of commandments. And what a great privilege for Israel to be under those, to have God reveal himself through them and to kindly regulate his people. And then they had the service. This is the tabernacle service, the temple service, the Levites, the priests offering animal sacrifices as propitiatory sacrifices to make people, the people as a nation at one with God and to preview a greater sacrifice that would bring about individual salvation for all who believe. What amazing privilege. And then the promises. The promises embedded in the covenants, but also the promises in the prophets given to Israel, promises for hope and restoration. We'll get to some of those next week. And then the next privilege listed is the fathers. The fathers. This is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, fathers of the nation. By the way, uh, to say that Israel's privilege was the fathers is to say Israel's great heritage was unbelievable grace. Think about these guys. Abraham, the polygamist idolater. And God put his grace on him. Isaac, Jacob, you go down the line, these guys were swindlers, connivers, usurpers, and schemers. They feared man rather than God, they lied about stuff, and yet they believed God and it was credited to them as righteousness. Israel, that's your heritage. Grace through faith, God's initiating love, and His promise-keeping uh, nature. And then, of course, the last privilege listed here is the Christ, the Messiah. This is worded differently than all the preceding privileges. Notice the wording, from whom is the Christ? He doesn't say um, Christ belongs to Israel the way the other things belong to Israel. But Christ is out of Israel, from Israel. This is important. It's important because Jesus Christ isn't just for Israel. This is different than all the rest. Jesus the Christ came from Israel to rescue people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. And we sit here as beneficiaries of God's grace. He is out of Israel. And then this little caveat, according to the flesh. That is, in terms of his human descent. In terms of his human descent, he's a descendant of David. In terms of his human descent, he's of the line of Judah. In terms of his human descent, he's an Israelite, he's a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. But that's not all there is to say about this. Something more has to be said, and so Paul says it. From whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who, and the who is Christ, there's no other referent for the who here. If you're trying to connect your pronouns, your relative pronouns to the referent, there's only one grammatical possibility, and it's Christ. He is over all. He's Lord of everything. And grammatically in apposition, he is God blessed forever. Here's a remarkable statement about the deity of Christ. 
And it's an important one here because Paul just said, well, according to his humanity, he's a Jew, but uh, he's God in the flesh. In fact, he is God over everything. Him be blessed forever. A remarkable privilege to be a Jew, to be in the lineage from whom Messiah came. That, that, that Mary, the, the Jew, would be the womb for the incarnate Son of God, come to take away sin. The, the, the Jews who read the Old Testament prophets and, and were humble before the Lord and, and in faith looking forward to Messiah coming, got to hold him. Some got to see him hung up on a cross and killed in the place of sinners. And the first iteration of the church predominantly Jews who believed Messiah. The tragedy, the tragedy, tragedy here is like when sons squander the wealth of their father. The Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers who uh, built up wealth by industry and then the second generation throws it all away. The prodigal son throwing away his father's inheritance. Who besides Israel had such reason, such incentive to embrace Messiah? They had the most privileged position, and yet it was not leading to salvation, not leading to new birth. They needed new birth. They needed the gospel. What is the spiritual state of ethnic Israel today? By and large, apostate. What a tragedy. Separated from their Messiah. When we get to Romans eleven twenty eight, we'll have what Matt Wehmeyer calls the dual status of Israel. Eleven twenty eight says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, Israel, are enemies for your sake, Christian. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What a strange nation Israel is today. A beloved enemy, ethnically speaking, nationally speaking. Romans 1.16, the Jews were Paul's evangelistic priority. In 3.1, Paul tells us what advantage do the Jews have much in every way. And in 8.28, we find out that God turns evil for good. God will, in fact, turn Jewish rejection of Messiah into good for Gentiles. The faithfulness of God, the love of God on display here. When enemies become objects of mercy... In Romans 5.10, that was us. We were enemies, and God loved his enemies, and we got saved. And in Romans 11.28, it'll be the Jews. Enemies of the gospel, beloved because of the fathers, who will en masse believe the gospel one day. A few years ago, I sat next to a woman on the plane. In fact, it was when we were uh, working through Isaiah 40 to 48 here on Sunday mornings. And uh, so I had Isaiah 45 open on my computer, my Bible open, Hebrew text up on the... And she says, oh, is that Hebrew? I said, do you know Hebrew? And this is a, a older lady. And she says, well, yeah, I, I studied Hebrew in, in school. I went to a Jewish school. I said, are you Jewish? She said, yes. I said, um, like, believing in the Bible kind of Jewish? She said, well, Yeah. Uh, I said, um, have, have, you, have you ever read Isaiah 45? She said, no, we weren't allowed to read the prophets. I said, really? What, 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 did, did you read the writings? You know, the threefold division of the Old Testament is the law, the prophets, the writings. Uh, no, we, we were shunned away from the writings as well. That would be the Psalms and the wisdom literature, etc. Well, what did you read? Torah. The first five books, the Pentateuch, the law. I said, oh, great, have, did you ever come across that? We just started this conversation. And, and I said, um, can, I, can I show you what, I, what the prophet Isaiah says? And we turned to Isaiah 53. And we just read it together, out loud, on this airplane. I didn't give any commentary. I said, Who, who's the prophet talking about? And she said, of course it's Jesus. I know that. It can't be anybody else. Why didn't they let us read the prophets? She said, but it's too late for me. 
I'm a Jew and I'm old. I can't, I, I, I can't change. I said, oh, but you can change. <laughs> can, can I tell you what's in store for the Jewish people? And I took her to Zechariah 12.10. The day when the Jews en masse will repent and return because the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out upon them and they will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as for an only son. The Jews will believe. And, and, and I brought her to this section in Romans. And I said, listen, there, there's a day coming when, when Israel en masse will repent and believe the gospel. They will believe Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? Isaiah says, well, someday the Jews will. And, and in the meantime, there's a remnant. I, I, I know some Jews who believe in Messiah. You can too. I haven't heard from her. I don't, I don't know what she did with that. But what a, what a tragic situation to be in. She, she actually can't keep Mosaic law. There's no temple. You can't do the sacrifices. Much less just trying to keep the rules as a human. You just can't. So she couldn't keep Mosaic law. She was not allowed to read the prophets. They avoided the writings. Today, Tel Aviv is purported to be the, the international hotspot for what we will delicately call immorality tourism. What is the state of ethnic Israel today? Irreligious, agnostic, apostate. Paul had unceasing grief and great sorrow in his heart. He's going to encourage us Gentiles not to despise. And we ought to pray. Uh, closing song, uh, you might think is a Christmas song, a first Advent song. It's actually a second Advent song too. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I'm going to pray and then we'll sing it. God, we thank you so much for your grace. We revel in it. We, we sit at the top of the mountain in the dizzying heights of your mercy and your love, secure. And, and we want to feel what Paul expresses, an anguish and a grief for those around us whom we love who don't yet know Christ, who have not experienced forgiveness of sin, who don't know the security of your love, who don't have a home in heaven. And, and we can't help in seeing Paul's heart here to ache for the nation of Israel for whom were all of these privileges and yet in such large measure cut off from Christ. Oh God, would you be pleased to rescue your people Israel? Would you be pleased to bring in all the fullness of the Gentiles? Oh God, would you use us as means to that end to sorrowfully, joyfully plead with those who don't know you to have life, to have everything in Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen.